I don't know that the Eagles are getting an incredible player, but that's fine. I mean, if he's a really good starting cornerback or just even a good starting cornerback, then you know it's a fine contract, and you, may, you can figure out if you want to re-sign him after this year or let him walk and maybe help your comp pick formula. So, you know, overall, I think you know it fills a big hole on the Eagles' defense and really kind of helps further eliminate any excuses for Jonathan Gannon. You know, I think the defense arguably underperformed their talent level last year. Uh, if that happens again, I, I think the way to frame it is like Jonathan Gannon shouldn't be here next year because either he did a great job, he's going to get hired as so someone else's head coach, or he underperformed and he shouldn't be back another season. It is another Eagles Talk Week here on Bird 365 as we get another week closer to the 2022 Philadelphia Eagles season with people are excited about his fellow uh, We are bringing a third voice into the mix. He is the publisher and editor of Bleeding Green Nation and a frequent contributor here, and we always learn something whenever we bring BLG Brendan Lee Gouton into the mix. How are you, big guy? I'm doing great. How's it going, guys? Hey, BLG. Good to see you. Uh, I love it. There, we did it. We did the RVD thing. Um I don't know if you heard while you're in the green room, but Jody and I were discussing uh, Peter King's uh, power rankings and all. But and, and I kind of mentioned I I want to see where you are with this, uh, Brandon. I noticed this incredible sea change started day one of the draft where people went from, all right, this Eagles team isn't ready for this, isn't ready for that, till now yeah, we're there, we're right there, hmm. we're it's ready to go. Uh, and Peter had them as ninth uh, in the NFL, fourth in the NFC. Do you think people are starting to skip steps? Now we've had this huge pendulum, like this team is bang right there and better than the Dallas's of the world and the San Francisco's and the Arizona's. Skipping steps or not, BLG? I think when you look at the context of the division, you know, obviously it's easy to point to the Eagles maybe trending up, whereas opposed to the Cowboys, I think are very much trending not so much up. I think they've gotten worse this offseason in a lot of ways. I think it's hard to say how Dallas has gotten better in any way. Um, but at the same time, the Eagles haven't exactly owned the Cowboys and until they, they can actually beat. And in fact, when Jalen Hurts has started against Dallas, it's only two times. Um both blowout losses. So the Eagles yeah. very much have to prove they're the team to beat in the NFC East. But I think when you combine, you know, the schedule release into the mix here too, and the Eagles have obviously one of the easiest, if not like the easiest schedule in the NFL, just based on the teams they're playing and the quarterbacks they're playing. And you look at how they've improved in a lot of ways. And I get there's plenty of cases for optimism. No one, no team is going to have a perfect roster, so I get they have the whole safety. But I guess the one thing for me, it's still I mean, it's a big question mark. And Peter King, I believe, did say in his rankings, he mentioned Jalen Hurts being like a C plus quarterback. And you know, your ceiling is only so high yeah. when you have that kind of player. You know, at least he gets it to ninth because that's where Peter <laughs> has him, even with a C plus quarterback. Uh, BLG, I'm not as worried about the Eagles fans jumping the gun a little bit and pushing the needle a little too fast off the off season they've had uh, and just judging where they fall in comparison to the other teams in the, in the NFC. Here's the one area where I do think they've gotten a little ahead of themselves and maybe it's Howie Roseman bringing it on himself because he's had as good an off season as he's had. They get a little greedy, at least here on uh, our stream and on my Twitter Jesse Bates. Now we got to get Jesse Bates. We can get Jesse Bates. All we got to do is give up a package and we'll be able to get you. Let's add Jesse Bates. They've done such a good job of checking the boxes and filling the holes and acquiring the players they have. They think anyone is now in within reach. There's no chance they're going to be able to get a guy like Jesse Bates, is there? I wouldn't say no chance. You look at the Bengals. Uh, history of paying players. They're not exactly, you know, the, the the team to rush to pay guys. Notoriously not big spenders. So, and you look at the fact that his age too, I believe is only 24, 25. Like that could be a long-term piece uh, for this team. It's not like you're selling out for a guy who's 29 or so and, and might, you know, you might be paying beyond his prime years. So I think it's possible. I don't know, likely. I think Eagle Sands and every fan 
uh, every fan base kind of gets into a mode in the off season where, you know, there's that one hot name out there and it was Bradbury for a while. And I didn't think the Eagles were going to get him, but they did. Um, but then it's like, okay, we got him. Now it's the next thing. It's always, you know, you're moving on to the next name that's out there. So I think part of it's that. Um, the Bradbury signing, uh, Brandon, when you look at how the Eagles were able to get it done, a um, little bit over $7 million in guaranteed money, uh, typical voidable years, Howie contract, where it's going to be two point, less than 2.3 on the salary cap. Um, what does that tell you? Um, now, the timing tells you a lot. The calendar, it's not a great time for Bradbury to hit the open market, but I thought he'd get a little bit more than that. Is that uh, a little reason to press pause uh, on James Bradbury? Well, yeah, I, I don't think this is like a Pro Bowl. I know he was in the Pro Bowl a couple of years ago, but I don't know that you know he's going to be a Pro Bowl player for the Eagles, I think. You know, obviously there were a lot of financial reasons why the Giants moved on from him. But if he was still kind of like an all pro, pro bowl kind of player, they either would have kept him probably or they would have had a better market for him and might have been able to trade him a little bit more easier with teams really trying to make sure they got him and didn't just let him go to free agency. So, you know, I think he's coming off a season where he missed like something like 12 tackles, a lot of missed tackles. Um, he had the worst passer rating allowed of his last four years. It was still good. It was like in the 90s. It wasn't terrible or anything. But point being, like he's not coming off as strong this year. So, you know, I don't know that the Eagles are getting an incredible player, but that's fine. I mean, if he's a really good starting quarterback or just even a good starting quarterback, then, you know, it's a fine contract. And you, may, you can figure out if you want to resign him after this year or let him walk and maybe help your comp pick formula. So, you know, overall, I think, you know, it fills a big hole on the Eagles defense and really kind of helps further eliminate any excuses for Jonathan Gannon. You know, I think the defense arguably underperformed their talent level last year. Uh, if that happens again, I, I think the way to frame it is like Jonathan Gannon shouldn't be here next year because either he did a great job, he's going to get hired to someone else's head coach or he underperformed and he shouldn't be back another season. Yeah, I think both you guys are underrating James Bradbury. That's why I was beating the drum as loudly as I was prior to their signing to get this done. I think he got a fair contract for uh, uh, joining the free agent fray at this time of the year. I think the Eagles paid fair market value for him, not above and beyond, but not below. I don't think they got a bargain either. Mm -hmm. I think he is a borderline Pro Bowl quarterback which I'll take him over Zach McPherson every day of the week and twice on Sundays. So you have to put it in the context of who he's replacing in the Eagles lineup. I thought it was a hell of a signing for Harry Roseman. But uh, again, yes, have some concerns that the Eagles think that now they can do anything. Eagle fans get a little carried away. What have we got? James Bradman, why can't we get uh, Jesse Bates? Yeah, They're not going to be able to pay the price going to be at least a first round draft pick to, to be able to get your hands on Bates in a trade right you don't think the Eagles would give up one of those two draft picks they love the safety net they have for next year going into a draft where they may need to take a quarterback if that's the price they're not going there are they Brandon right yeah I don't I don't think they want to part with a first for that like you said I think they have those earmarked for a quarterback if if they need it obviously if Jalen Hurts plays really well great then they don't have to do that but I definitely think they're they're holding that in their back pocket you know I wonder if they can put a package that might be strong enough without a first round pick like you know maybe maybe some kind of second and like an Isaac Sumalo you know, obviously have a lot of offensive line depth we know uh, the Bengals could use some offensive line help so maybe there's something that can get done there Obviously, uh, I think some of this comes down to, too, a sense of maybe how dug in Jesse Bates is with the Bengals and, like, he's really just not going to play and, and kind of really forces his way out of there and puts Cincy kind of in a bad spot. Um, so, yeah, again, I, I would say it's less than 50% chance, you know, he gets traded to the Eagles, but I would say, you know, it's above, like, 10, somewhere in there. Yeah, one of, one of the reasons, because I've heard Isaac a couple times with Cincinnati, and it makes sense from the perspective that that was their big – issue obviously the offensive line even though they made it to the Super Bowl but I do think it's kind of funny to think that all right one of the reasons he might be available Jesse Bates is that the Bengals are the Bengals and they don't want to pay players right and then we say well give him Isaac who's really expensive <laughs> for a guard who doesn't play so I'm not sure that's as natural a bit 
as people would assume, because again, it's the Bengals, so they probably don't want that contract either. Um, off base there. I think the Samalo thing, just kind of taking it in, in his future, is interesting, especially when Herbig was still here. I guess maybe it's more likely that he stays now, that Herbig is gone. But I thought with Herbig here, it's like they have all these bodies yeah. on the interior offensive line. And Samalo is basically going to be a free agent after this season. And he's only played in like nine games or nine so. Games, yeah. yeah, the past Over two years. Two years yeah. yeah, so that's not great. Um, and he's going to be like 29 or so. So, you know, you kind of have to decide, like, is this a guy you want to pay? Is he here for the long haul? Um, is it worth keeping him just the year? And it might be. You know, it's obviously good to have a lot of offensive line depth and guys who can play multiple positions like he can. Um, but I think it is interesting to think about his future. I feel like, you know, it's him. Oh, yeah. Or, I think the Eagles would yeah. n- like to probably move on from yes. that contract. But I'm not sure the Bengals side of it would make much sense because of the way they do business. And that's one of the reasons we said, well, maybe you can pry Jesse Bates away because, you know, the Bengals drafted a safety um, and they can go the cheaper route. And that's typically the way they do things. But then again, on the back end of that, you probably don't want Isaac's contract after playing just nine games in two years. From the Bengals perspective, I, I don't think it's it's a match unless it's just like you know a case of a team overcorrecting a little bit it's like well the offensive line undid our season so now we have to throw like all the resources we possibly can at it to make sure that doesn't happen again and sometimes teams do that and they fix that area but then something else you know a hole uh springs loose on the um so maybe it's like that and we'll have uh, brad spielberg next hour i think i read somewhere today that the bengals are in the best cap shape in the National Football League as of right now. So they've got to spend it. Will they spend it is another question, John. You're right. They always find ways to keep money in-house. But if they really want to take a shot at going back to the Super Bowl, a guy like Sam Malo would uh, make some sense for that. All right, uh, BLG, did see on your site, you, you tapped into the uh, inquiry as well. A couple of different sites are saying, Howie Roseman more leverage as the general manager of the Philadelphia Eagles, certainly since he came back and took over uh, from Chip Kelly when they put Howie away for a couple of years to go uh, scour the globe on how to be a general manager. And he came back better for it, uh, Super Bowl championship. And as of right now, maybe more leverage than he's had ever in the organization before. And Jeff Lurie isn't as hands-on as he used to be. Well, Jeff Lurie would be the first one to tell you that, that he's never been all that hands on a uh, owner. I'm not sure we all believe three that. But three yeah, just three times. <laughs> three three times. And damn if he wasn't good on all three of those. Um, are you buying what uh, they're selling, that Jeff Lurie has really put all of his eggs in Howie Roseman's basket and has total and utter faith? If he does, I think he's paid some dividends this offseason. But do you think that Howie is more in control how much did the defections from the front office to the other organizations play into that? Well, I wonder if we'd be seeing the same kind of report uh, if the same thing was going on in theory, but like the off season wasn't as critically acclaimed. Maybe you know would we be seeing the same kind of leak? <laughs> like, oh yeah, it's how yeah. we making all the moves, and the moves aren't very popular. So I, you know, I had to kind of take things with a grain of salt and wonder whose agenda and who who is you know leaking what, um, but. I will say I think Eagles fans should hope it's true in the sense that I think the Eagles have needed kind of, uh, you know, the the athletic and the inquirer have both done really good reporting on basically, I think, you know, a lot of dysfunction in the front office in the past. And I think part of that has been how we maybe delegating too much and not collaborating in a way that I think is actual collaborating. Like collaborating to me is not just everyone taking turns at random points. Like let's just say, for example, the coaching staff getting their way when it comes to the Jalen Rager pick. Like to me, um, a collaborative process is, you know, getting all the input from all sides and then someone at the top, Howie Roseman, like making a decision based on that information, but he has to own the decision and not be able to just pass the buck on the coach, coaching staff if they make a bad draft pick, like again, Jalen Rager. Um, so uh, <laughs> it makes sense to me that he should be leading the charge and should be at the top good or bad, because then if they do well, great. How he gets all the credit. If they do poorly, okay, well, then you know who's the blame. Yeah, it is interesting, Brandon. I've always, because I've had an issue with that 
you know, and Jeffrey pushes that collaborative word a lot. And he made a big deal when he went. I think people kind of forget when he brought Howie back, it was sort of like, you know, we were all wondering, all right, he didn't call him general manager. And and if you remember, Brandon, he, he kind of put him back and then we didn't get to talk to him forever. And it, it kind of was like, it became osmosis. He just kind of morphed back into the position and the big buzzword, the corporate buzzword was collaboration. He's got to collaborate more. He's got to get along with people more. And I think there has been times over the years where he said, all right, you know what? I want Justin Jefferson. The scouts want Justin Jefferson, but Doug and the staff wants Jalen Rager. Let's defer to them. Um, Jeffrey Laurie, despite what he's saying, JJ Ortega. Well, okay, let's defer to the owner. Um, and then there's this sort of power vacuum that's developed because the Eagles have lost so many people. Mm. I think we're at eight people now. Some of them they didn't lose; they they moved on from in the personnel department. Um, so he almost has to make more decisions. Um, Good thing or bad thing that the power is centralized. Uh, you mentioned somebody's got to make a decision. I'm with you. I like that. I want somebody to say, all right, I hear your voices, but I'm making the decision. Isn't that the way it has to be? Yeah, I, I don't think those things are mutually exclusive. Like you can, you know, have again a process where voices are heard. Everyone is putting. I think you need people to feel like their input is being put in, uh, and you're gathering and collecting all that information and you're weighing it. But at the end of the day, you know, the the guy in charge or lady or whoever in charge has to make that decision. And yeah, so I think it's good to see how he's doing that. Um, I think <laughs> again, it's funny to me that it's coming out at this time when everyone is 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 you know praising their off season. Um, but to Howie's credit, I think, you know, he's done a good job and, you know, let's be clear here. This is all on paper too. Um, you know, the season starts and they're not winning games. Well, then all of a sudden it wasn't that great of an off season. So, uh, for now things look good and it seems positive, but as you mentioned, John, like they've lost a lot of people, they still might lose Andy Whitell. We'll see if he's going to become the Steelers GM or not. So, you know, there's a lot of work for Howie to still do, at least in terms of stocking that front office pipeline and making sure they don't really miss any beats there. All right, BLG, I want to ask you to compare going forward a couple of Eagle draft picks from just two years ago, 2020. Uh, they took both Kevon Wallace and Davion Taylor, Taylor in the third, Wallace in the fourth, in the same draft. Both have played sparingly over the two years here, way too much time on the injured list. They've done what they've done. They flashed when they flashed. They've been on the bench when they've been on the bench. The Eagles have made moves around their position accordingly. Which one's got a chance to still be part of the mix in 2023? I'm looking past 2022 to 2023. Mm. So you're factoring in what you think they're going to do in 2022. Which one has a better chance of being a contributing eagle going forward past this year, Taylor or uh, Wallace? That's a good question. Uh, I'm going to say Taylor in part because TJ Edwards and Kaiser White are both on the final years of their deals. So in theory, they could both be gone next year and maybe Taylor steps up with N'Kobe Dean. I think Taylor showed some promise in training camp last year early on. Now, you know, didn't stay healthy and didn't prove it in the real games, really. So still much for him to prove. But I feel like I may have seen more potential out of him than I really ever have seen out of Kayvon Wallace. And I know they have a big hole at safety, and there's an opportunity for him to step up there, too. Um, but I just I, I'll see it when I believe it more so with him. I really haven't seen that that potential that makes me believe, OK, there's something here with him and he can step up into a starting role. So I'll say Taylor, and in part two, just because I think at the very least, Taylor might be able to help you out in special teams. I think that's another area where he's kind of shown some things, or at least offers a little bit more intriguing upside than Kayvon Wallace does. Uh, so I'll go with him. Uh, let's talk about safety, uh, Brandon, uh, with Kayvon Wallace. And you mentioned, I think we all agree, there's there's a big hole at, at safety, and there's the one noticeable hole on this team right now is its safety. But what is the bigger part of the whole, Marcus Epps or Anthony Harris? Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people default to Marcus Epps 
I think Anthony Harris, I think Epsi is the ascending player Mm -hmm. and Anthony Harris is the descending player. I mean, the Eagles literally gave Anthony Harris a contract that is half the value of than they did last year. They signed him to a one-year, $5 million deal initially. They brought him back on a one-year, $2.5 million deal. So not the, like, the best sign necessarily in terms of yeah, uh, a player and their value and how they performed last season and the demand for that player. So definitely something to consider there. Seems like a stopgap you know, at most. And then, yeah, I think there's potential for Epps. I still think, ideally, he's more of a spot starter, a guy, a role player who can kind of rotate in. I don't think – I think he was one of your best two safeties. And then, God forbid, he might be your best safety if someone gets hurt, uh, if Harris gets hurt. That's not great. It's not ideal. Um, but it's where they are right now. And it's hard to see anything changing because unless they trade for Jesse Bates, there aren't really – or Chuck Clark, maybe um, there. You know, there's. It's not like there's a a James Bad Bradbury safety version on the market anymore. There's no like player like really intriguing out there that they can just sign. Um, and I don't know if they're going to want to do that. It seems like they are high on Epps. I think maybe even more so um, than you know they were with their cornerbacks clearly. And also Howie Roseman saying we have a higher position or we have a higher view of that position than maybe the media does and everything. So I think there's some truth to that. You know, Epps has been here for multiple seasons now. Um, he's kind of, his role has grown. He's, for not being a full-time starter ever, he's gotten a decent amount of playing time. So it's not like he doesn't have experience under his belt. And that doesn't mean he'll be good. Um, but it does mean it's not like he's being totally thrown to the wolves here and doesn't know what he's getting into. So, uh, so we'll see. BLG, my uh, buddy and partner here, John McMullen, emphasizes this often. And he's right to do so. Uh, The fact that the Eagles, like every other team in the National Football League, I'm not uh, singling out the Eagles, but everybody's got less time to evaluate talent before the first regular season game. Practices are shorter, cut back because of the collective bargaining agreement. Nick Sirianni at all, the entire organization, seemed to cut back on it even more so. That, ah, we don't have to do that much work. Science is telling us where guys are more healthy because we actually do less. Uh, There are only three preseason games, whereas we used to have four to be able to evaluate these guys. So it's a tougher job, and perception has to come more into the mix in putting together rosters and depth charts at specific positions because they just don't have as much time to evaluate. Guys can't go out and win jobs the way they used to. And John harps on this, and he's right. It's it's accurate. So I'm going to ask you about the tight end position. We know Dallas Goddard is TE1. Who's two, TE2, TE3, TE4? We would love to be able to say, well, they're decided themselves on the field of battle. Except they don't, because they practice less and they've only got three preseason games. So perception's a big part of it. How do you rank the Eagles' tight ends behind Goddard? So if Tyree Jackson was healthy, I think he would be your tight end too. But alas, he's not. And I'm guessing he's going to start the season on the pup list, which means he'll be out for at least six weeks. Um, I think it's almost like a 2A and 2B with uh, Jack Stoll and Grant Calcaterra in terms of Jack Stoll's probably the better blocking tight end, which is significant for a team that I don't think they're going to run the ball as much as they were last year, where they were the (laughs) heaviest run team in the NFL. But I still, you know, that's going to be part of their attack for sure. And so he gets playing time there. And I think Calcaterra, based on his profile and kind of what he did at college, you know, he probably has more pass catching chops. So I think, you know, it could be like a mix of those kind of two skill sets and, and almost a rotation between those guys, as opposed to one guy just being totally out out in front of the other just because of the varying skill sets there. So I would give Stoll the edge just because, you know, he's he has more experience uh, in the system. He's an older player. Um, he's had, you know, This will be his first full offseason, you know, to really train in a full uh, program and everything. So I'll give him the edge, but I think it's kind of a mix. Um, you know, when we look at this team, Brandon, and, and we start looking at positions, we mentioned safety, obviously quarterback. Um, then you generally go to the depth. You just mentioned tight end. You get a great tight end, but you start wondering, uh, we don't have much depth here. Can Grant Calcaterra step up? Can Jack Stoll get better? Any other positions you're kind of looking at and saying, uh, okay, we might have a, a pretty good starter, but 
sprained ankle, somebody's out for two, two to three, four weeks. Any other areas where you're concerned and saying, I'd like to have a little more depth here? That's a really good question. Um, it kind of speaks to the roster. I think that they build up that I don't really see that as much. No, obviously, so there's some positions I think that look better on paper necessarily than like linebacker. Like we're just assuming that Nicobe Dean is going to come in and be awesome, and maybe he will. But again, there's a reason he fell, and I want to see how he holds up through training camp, and if he's there out there every day, and he's he's not getting banged up and missing time, and uh, and how he adjusts to the NFL. So you know, until we actually see linebackers solved for the Eagles, and you just look at the history uh, of their signings at that position, you know, it's not like necessarily just based on history. Kaiser yeah. White should even be considered a lock to make the team or through the, make it through the year based on, you know, Eric Wilson and Zach Corey Brown. Nelson. Poor Corey Nelson. Paul Warlow. Yeah, Paul Warlow. Yeah. LJ Fort was good, LJ, but it didn't yeah. last. Yeah, so, like, you know, uh, let's see that happen uh, before we just assume it's definitely going to be solved. I think, I guess that's the position where, you know, they have some nice things on paper, but it's very so much. You got to prove it. All right, BLG, last one for me. Aaron Sipots or Bust? <laughs> Will there be another punter yeah. born into camp? If so, this week, next week, the week after, as soon as camp opens, week two of the preseason, week uh, one of the NFL regular season. When will Aaron Sipas and hey, I'm rooting for the guy. I hope he's phenomenal all year and the Eagles don't have to bring anybody else in. And he does the job all 17 weeks. You got to remember, Aaron, 17 weeks. He kind of checked out after week nine for me last week, last year. Uh, but will they have a competition there or is it all sip, sip us? I mean, they should. Uh, it's a little surprising that they haven't at least added, you know, some undrafted rookie free agent or someone. I mean, he was really bad at the end of last year. I think he had something yeah. like an average of 37 yards per punt on his last 12 punts, basically since December started. So clearly the cold weather being an issue for him, although – he still did struggle when he was down in Tampa in the playoffs as well, and it was not cold there. So uh, that's a big hole because he was really bad at the end of the season. And I'm guessing the Eagles are kind of going to be paying attention closely to uh, these teams that drafted punters and maybe kind of have interest in the veteran that they'll probably cut if it gets down to that point. So I definitely think that's a position they'll be looking at. It's funny. We're talking about the punter, but but it is important because it was yeah. like, Sip, Sipos was really bad at the end of the last year. And I would think it would be crazy to just go into this year and think like, okay, he'll get better. Or, you know, that wasn't that big of a deal. No, it was a pretty big deal. And they definitely need to be looking for an uh, opportunity to upgrade if it becomes available. Well, I always tell Jody, Brandon, that it's the off season. So it's time to nitpick. So my last one, I'm going to nitpick even more. <laughs> uh, but I want to throw this out at you. And before I say this, I... Follow Brandon on Twitter at Brandon Gowton. Obviously, you can read him at bleedinggreennation.com. Listen to him at BGN underscore radio. Uh, does about 40 podcasts are we up to, Brandon? It's at least three a week, yeah. Um, now, guy nobody talks about. I was just thinking about this the other day. Jacoby Stevens, hmm. who was a late-round pick, six-round pick last year, uh, good safety at LSU. The Eagles transitioned him to linebacker. Um, they they obviously brought in all this talent at linebacker. Nakobe Dean, Kaiser White, TJ Edwards is coming off a, a, a really good season. Maybe the most underrated player on this team. Um, Davion Taylor, we mentioned. Um, why not move him back to safety? And if you don't move him back to safety, you have this sort of hybrid anyway. You can do it both and then maybe play on special teams as well because that was a hurdle for this team, not just the punter, but the coverage units, the returners. Kind of an afterthought now. Should people be forgetting about Jacoby Stevens or my nitpicking in the offseason trying to come up with something? No, I think that makes sense. I think I've thought about that too. I remember Jacoby Stevens when he got some playing time, very limited last year, probably, you know, week 18. Yeah. Seemed to struggle with the physicality of the game a little bit, like being in the box and getting pushed around. So maybe you move him further away from uh, the ball and that would help him. Uh, it, just because of the numbers crunch, like they have a lot of linebackers. The numbers, just even the, it's not even just like they don't have, uh, you know, like established 
options that you feel great about starting at safety, but just the numbers on the roster really aren't even there. And meanwhile, you have like 20 cornerbacks on the team. It's like, can any of those guys maybe move over and maybe you move Jacoby Stevens over in two, at least to see uh, something shakes out there. So yeah, I'm on board with that because I think, like they they were entering this offseason with this approach at cornerback, like, hey, we're just going to throw a bunch of stuff at the wall and see if something sticks. I don't really get why they're not doing that safety, especially now, because they kind of really need to find an answer there. And I think that approach would be good at that position. Uh, so we'll see if they do that or not. I'm going to guess he just sticks at linebacker, but I do think uh, his best chance at making the team and sticking around could be more so at safety. Last thing uh, for me, it's not a question as much as it a point uh, response to Brandon's answer to my question. Uh, you said the teams that drafted a punter, their veteran guy. Well, one of them already lost that veteran guy because Sam Coke retired, right. I believe, at the age of 39, was the Ravens punter, uh, I believe, last millennium. Does he go back into the 1990s? I mean, maybe it was only the mid-2000 uh, th- and aughts. But, hey, Randy Brown, you owe us one. Yeah. The former mayor of Malton is co- kicking coach down there in Baltimore. <laughs> tell him where the best housing is in Malton. If he needs to know, I can tell him. I, I got no problem bringing in a 39-year-old punter. Do you bring the LG? Well, don't the Eagles have uh, that assistant, John, too? Who's, uh... Yes, the son. Come on, let's yeah. get this thing done yeah. here. Old Coke is good Coke. Yeah, I, I Randy, think that's true. Okay, Randy sure. calls it the Ravens Kicking Academy, which is the best in, has been the best in the business. But he's, you know, he's flying high on Justin Tucker's reputation, Randy. Let's be honest. Yeah. Brandon and I could coach Justin Tucker. I'm just joking, <laughs> Randy. Greatest but, kicker who ever lived. And Sam Cook's been a damn good yeah, he's been for the last good. 14 years. So, Forget yeah. about Jesse Bates. Needs Sam Cook in here. Yeah. There you go. Now we've got, now we're cooking. Very good. Uh, BLG, good stuff. Always a pleasure whenever you get Thanks, uh, get John. Thank you very much for getting up early with us today. We'll talk to you again in a couple weeks. See you guys.